Well, good morning again. Thank you for being here. I always look forward to us gathering on Sunday mornings and being able to, with one voice, worship through song. And I will ask you to remember a line from that last song where we just together in unison said that your way is better. Better is your way. Um, We continue today in our series through the fruit of the Spirit. We're looking at the nine virtues that make up that fruit, and we've looked at love and joy and peace. And today, we look at patience. And I can't tell you how long I've been waiting to bring you a message on patience, but here we are, finally. So what I want to do is define patience as best as we can, talk about what it is, a little about what it's not, and look at two truths about it, universal truths that we need to accept and why it's important to us, why patience should be a priority in our lives. So what is patience? If we go through the fruit of the Spirit, and I'll read the list to you, it's in verse 22 of Galatians 5, he says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. What is patience in here? We'll see, we have seen that this is not a random order to the list. God knows what he's doing. And when he put this in this order, we'll see that, that peace plays a big part in having patience. And we talked about peace last week and and how love and joy help with that, and how they're really all linked together. But the word in the original is a compound word made of two words, the first being long, and the second being temper. So the idea of patience is that we are long-tempered, not a word we use, and often, I don't know if I've ever heard anybody use it, we use short-tempered, and we will define and describe somebody as short-tempered, maybe even ourselves, but not somebody else. We don't talk about someone being long-tempered. Some translations of the Bible will translate that as long-suffering. And we'll see in the definition of what biblical patience is, it comes from God. It's a fruit of his spirit, something that he gives. It's something that he develops and grows, and then it manifests itself out in our lives. There is an element to this of discomfort, of pain, of suffering that comes with it. So this idea of patience is is a person that can endure, right? This is what we try to teach our kids because we're not born with patience, something we develop. Um, And and we we try to um, uh, just get them to wait. But real patience and this long suffering brings in this element of discomfort. So if we were going to define this biblically, I think that the definition would be that patience is enduring discomfort without worry or complaint. It's enduring discomfort, enduring suffering, enduring pain without worrying or complaining. And this is where the peace part came in because we talked about worrying last week. And this type of patience requires love and joy and peace And this type of patience requires humility, and we see this all through Jesus' life here on planet Earth, how he interacted with people that you and I would probably have interacted with very differently because our patience would have been tested like his, but we would have failed the test. But he was very humble. It's about self-control to a degree, and it's about faith, that our patience is really dependent on our faith. J.I. Packer describes it this way. He said, patience is the Christ-like reaction to all that is maddening. Anything that we find frustrating, agitating, irritating, annoying, he said it's the Christ-like reaction to all of those things that bother us. Do we exhibit, do we live out our faith? So here's what patience is not as we develop this. Patience is not just restraint. That's how the world would define patience. Patience is that you didn't explode, that your rage didn't come out, that you just sat and you grinned and bared it, and they would applaud you for your patience. But we know that God works from the inside out, not from the outside in. So the patience that a follower of Christ 
would be exhibiting, but would be manifested through their life, that others would be able to see the evidence of their faith and his work in them, would start on the inside, not the outside. God's not going to be real pleased if, if we just grin and bear it. If when we find things agitating or frustrating or painful, that, that we just get through it. That we think a, the success in our life of patience is that the rage we experienced when we got cut off in our car was that we didn't run them off the road. That's, that's not patience. It's not just walking away from somebody who's testing your patience rather than telling them how you really feel about them. It's not faking a smile in front of somebody and feeling like I've, I'm, I'm patient now. It's internal. And God focuses on the inside, the work that he's doing in our soul and in our spirit. So we have this inward focus. So the patience that is being described here, that is the real patience, anything the world offers uh, that looks like patience is a counterfeit. It's not real and it won't work and it won't last. But it's this motivation and condition of our heart. That's what matters to God. Why are we being patient? What's the motivation behind the behavior? Not that we're exhibiting patience, but that it's actually patience coming through us. It's not just self-control. Self-control is a fruit of the Spirit, so there is an element of this, but it's not the only element of patience. Patience is not resistance either. Resistance to God. We may feel God leading us in a direction to do a certain thing, and we have clarity about it, but we don't want to do it. So we say, I'm going to pray about this. I'm going to sit on this for a while. I'm going to make sure this is really good. I want to be patient. I don't want to rush into something. When we know it's the truth, when we know it's in God's word, and we feel that leading in our life, to say that we're just going to be patient is probably more likely resistance to what God's asking us to do. It'll look like patience, but it's really not. So here's the two truths about patience that we must accept. First is that you and I and we are impatient. We are born without patience. We could all get up and go to the orange room where the three-year-olds are, and we could see a room where patience is being developed. <laughs> there would be a shortage of patience in that room, I'm sure. This is how we're born. This is the sin nature, the flesh that we are born into. I read a short poem about this. I'll share it with you. Patience is a virtue. Possess it if you can. Found seldom in a woman and never in a man. That is patience. And some of us feel like we're patient people. Others of us, we know that if the fruit of the Spirit look like an orange and we start to peel back the skin, that that segment that is patience probably is going to be a little bit smaller, a little maybe discolored, not look as healthy as maybe the other ones because patience is our weakness. Patience is really a hard lesson to learn. It's the hardest of the lessons to learn, patience is. But we're born impatient. If we don't think we are, think about some of the situations we find ourselves in and and how long, by the world's definition, would we say we're patient? How about when you call a company and they answer the phone with, thank you for calling, can you hold please? And they put you on hold before you can answer. How does that make you feel? How about when you're in a rush at the grocery store and you walk up and you can't find a line with less than five or six people in it? How are, how are you feeling then? My favorite is, is when you're in a situation, you're in a place where your patience is being tested, there's some tension, some, maybe some anxiety, it's building in the room, and somebody reminds you that you just need to be patient. Those words fitting never, right? The last thing we want to hear. So why do we lose our patience? Why are we impatient? Is it elusive? Is patience something that we had? Because we tell people this, like, they were doing okay, but then they lost their patience. Like, it just vanished. It disappeared. It's hiding. We have to go search for it again. Philosophers would describe it this way. It's egocentric predicament. This is what causes us to lose our patience. Egocentric predicament. That when we find ourselves in a place where 
our desires are being challenged. I want to get out of this store as quick as I can. I've got to get someplace. The game's about to start. And the person in front of us breaks out a change purse and they start counting. I had a, I had a person in front of me the other day at the store, three or four people in front of me, pull out a checkbook. And immediately in my mind, I went, what is this, 1857? Who writes checks? <laughs> but this egocentric predicament says that I can only view my desires in this moment, that I, I have no concern for anybody else around me. It's all about me. I'm immediately aware of only my wishes, my desires, my needs, and my wants. And I don't care about anybody else's. We don't look around and say, I'm waiting for this doctor to call me back. How long does it take a radiologist to read this scan or this x-ray? We're not thinking maybe about somebody in a much more serious situation that they might be dealing with in the moment. It's egocentric. That's how we're born. We're selfish by nature. We want what we want when we want it, and we should have it the way we want it. But this is why we lose our patience because it becomes all about us. So it's a problem when we lose it. It's a problem that we're impatient because impatience is opposite of the fruit of the spirit that we see. If when we lose our patience, it's agitation, it's frustration, it's discouragement, it's bitterness, it's resentment, it's a desire for revenge to make things even with somebody else. And our patience is continually being tested. And unlike the other virtues, I think patience is tested differently. It's much like steel or you're building a structure. Engineers know the, the load-bearing capacity of a beam, of a board, of a, of a piece of steel. They know how much weight it can hold until it doesn't function correctly, till it breaks, till it falls apart. And our patience is tested that same way. It's under weight, it's under duress, it's uncomfortable, it's painful. And we sit in that discomfort. And it gets tested in all kinds of ways. We're trying to get somewhere important and the car's not starting like it should. We get cut off in traffic, we're being treated unfairly at work. Someone didn't do something they promised they would do. Kids are fighting in the back of the car, especially on our way to church on Sunday morning. Just the weight of the situation tests our patience. So the first universal truth is that we are impatient by nature. We're impatient people. The second is, is that God is not. God is patient. No one is more patient than God. Patience is part of who he is. It's part of his character. We go back in the Old Testament, there's multiple references that almost put these words in the same order almost every time, but they describe God this way, merciful, graceful, and slow to anger. Patience is part of who he is. It's his character. So we're in a hurry. Some of us are always in a hurry. God is never in a hurry. God is not rushed. God does not have nervous energy. We do. God is patient because he's in control that everything will happen according to his plan and his timing. So he doesn't have to worry. He doesn't have to be impatient. But his patience is long, but not forever. It won't last forever, his patience with us. He warns us that there is a time when this will end this patience that he has, that it will not extend. There's a border his patience will not go beyond. There's an expiration date on his patience that it will not exceed. He's appointed a day in which he will come back and he will judge the world. You think about the way we interact and think about in God's position over all of mankind as creator and sustainer. We would not be as patient with us as he has been. We're not patient with each other like he is. But there is a day where he will come back and he will judge the world. It will end the day. That day will end his work in us and through us. It will be 
vindication for his children, for his saints, those that have served him faithfully, that he is fulfilling this promise to come back and restore order and to judge. So we live in this place right now of blessing because we're inside of his patience. We're within those boundaries. We're uh, before this expiration date. That is for our benefit, not his. If we were God, we would not have extended this much time to us. But he does. We're impatient with God and he is not impatient with us. So it matters. It matters to us. If we look at patience just in our lives, and I'm going to read through a bunch of texts as we continue. And some of you are thinking, how long is this message going to take? But we look at how patience affects us just in our character, in our life. Proverbs 15, 18 says that a hot-tempered person starts fights and a cool-tempered person stops them. Right, An impatient person starts fight. This is where the agitation and frustration, this is what it leads to. Jesus tells us in his Sermon on the Mount that blessed are the peacemakers. Patience is a part of that. A cool-tempered person stops fights. They bring peace. Proverbs 25, 15 says, patience can persuade a prince and soft speech can break bones. There's power in patience. People view patience in the world as weakness, but there's power in God's patience. Proverbs 14, 29 says that people with understanding control their anger. A hot temper shows great foolishness. There's wisdom in patience. There's wisdom in understanding that God gives us with his patience. Proverbs 16, 32 says, better to be patient than powerful. Better to have self-control than to conquer a city. If we polled the world those that are far from God, and said, what is more valuable to you, patience or power? I'm going to guess and say that power is going to be the overwhelming response. But here, God's word tells us that it's better to be patient than powerful, that patience brings self-control. This is how they're tied together. There's an old proverb, not biblical, that says, the man who can rule himself can rule others. A person who has that type of self-control will have influence over other people, whether they desire that or not. So it's better to be patient than powerful. God's patience is important for us because in this time that we're in, it allows for us to experience his mercy, his grace, his forgiveness, his salvation, and his sanctification. If God dealt with us the way we would deal with us, there would be no time left for repentance. We would, have, we would have ended this a long time ago. But he hasn't. He's allowing us time to respond to him, to see the truth about who he is, about who his son was, why he came here, what he did, and why we need him. In 2 Peter 3.15, he says, And remember our Lord's patience gives people time to be saved. This is what our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom God gave him. God's patience is for our benefit. 1 Timothy 1, or verses 12 through 16 says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength to do his work. He considered me trustworthy and appointed me to serve him even though I used to blaspheme the name of Christ. In my insolence, I protect, persecuted his people, but God had mercy on me because I did it in ignorance and unbelief. Oh, how generous and gracious our Lord was. He filled me with the faith and love that come from Christ Jesus. This is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them all. But God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience, even with the worst sinners. Then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. When Paul looks back on his life, And he looks at, he was a persecutor of Christians, persecuted them, had them arrested, beaten, put in prison, killed, meets Jesus on the road to Damascus, completely changes him. Now he's a missionary, serving, suffering 
for Christ. He goes back to this and he says, God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of not his love, not his mercy, not his grace, of his great patience. Paul saw the patience that God had with him because he didn't get what he deserved. But God gave him time to respond, to see the truth. And Paul uses this as as an example. He says, then others will realize, if God was patient enough with me to allow me to come to him through his son, he will you too. Because when it comes to sinners, I'm the worst of them all. 2 Peter 3, 9, he says, the Lord isn't really being slow about his promise. It's not like God forgot, got distracted, lowered it on the priority list, other things going on. He's not being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake and for my sake. He doesn't want anyone to be destroyed. He wants everyone to repent. This is his desire. He's giving time so that his lost children will come home. And in Romans chapter 2, verse 4, he says, don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? God is giving us time. He's being patient with us because he wants us to see the truth, that he is good and that he can be trusted. Because every attack of the enemy, every lie of the enemy are gonna come back to those two truths. And they're gonna say that God can't be trusted and God isn't good. So he's giving us time to see the truth and our need. And not only does he give us patience as he's waiting for us in our resistance to respond to him, he sent Jesus. And Jesus came to seek and to save those which were lost. He didn't just wait for us to come to him. He sent Christ to find us, to seek us out and to save us. So it gives us this time to respond. We're the beneficiary of his patience. But God's patience also gives us hope and confidence. Hope that God is at work and in control. This confidence that his his plan, his work will be fulfilled. That his promises are true. He keeps his word. He doesn't fail us. In Romans 12, 12, he writes, Rejoice in our confident hope be patient in trouble, and keep on praying. Be patient in trouble. When we find ourselves in troubling situations, a lot of times our response is, how do I get out of this? What do I need to do to alleviate this discomfort and pain? He says, be patient in trouble. And if we're gonna do something, he says, keep praying. Here's the instructions for those stressful, painful, uncomfortable situations. Be patient and keep praying. Put your hope and confidence where it belongs and with your heavenly father. A couple chapters back in Romans 8, verse 25 and 26, he says, but if we look forward to something we don't have yet, that's hope, right? That this will happen, this will come. He says, we must, we must wait And we wait in him with patience and confidence. And he says, and the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. When we're struggling with this, because we will, he sends the Holy Spirit to give us his strength. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35 and 36. He said, don't throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it brings you. Patient endurance is what you need now so that you will continue to do God's will. It's our strength. It's our hope. It's our confidence. He says, then you'll receive all that he's promised, that we're enduring in this life, patiently enduring the pain, the suffering, the discomfort, because our hope and confidence is what's to come. It's in God because he keeps his promises and that he can be trusted. Just a couple chapters back in Hebrews chapter six, he writes, then you will not become spiritually dull and indifferent. Instead, you will follow the example of those who are going to inherit God's promises because of their faith and endurance. For example, there was God's promise to Abraham. Since there was no one greater to swear by, God took an oath in his own name saying, I will certainly bless you and I will multiply your descendants upon or beyond number. Then Abraham waited patiently 
and he received what God has promised. There is this relationship, there is this link between patience and blessing, this, this, this bridge that connects biblical, godly, fruit of the Spirit, patience in our life, and standing on the hope and confidence of God's promises. We know as believers, this suffering, this pain, this discomfort, as bad as it can be, is temporary. That maybe we don't even experience a time in this life where we're not under duress and pain. But we know we will be for eternity. And so why is patience important to us? Well, like the other virtues of the fruit, we can't have it apart from God. So it's evidence of his work in our life. It's evidence of his sanctification, that he's changing us, that he loves us enough to meet us where we are, but loves us too much to leave us there, that he's got work for each of us to do. And he's gonna bring us through this process of separating us from the world, of making us holy, making us his. And patience is a big part of this. It changes us. God's patience in us changes us. It changes the way we interact with each other, with people. Romans 15, five says, may God who gives this patience and encouragement help you live in complete harmony with each other as is fitting for followers of Christ Jesus. This is the expectation as a follower of Christ that you would live in harmony with each other. And you live in this type of harmony with the patience that God gives you. God gives this. Ephesians 4, 2, he says, always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowances for each other's faults because of your love. We all have faults. We will let each other down. We will irritate each other. We will frustrate each other. We will agitate each other. Our patience will be tested. And he says, be patient. Make allowances. Extend some grace. 1 Thessalonians 5.14, brothers and sisters, we urge you to warn those who are lazy. Encourage those who are timid. Take tender care of those who are weak. Be patient with everyone. He says, here, warn this group of people that are lazy. Encourage this group who is timid. Take care of this group who are weak. But for everyone, be patient. It's for everybody. Colossians 3.12 says, since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. What we find is as our patience develops, it matures, it deepens, it strengthens, we can endure more. Things that used to bother us don't bother us anymore. Leonardo DiCaprio, no, Leonardo da Vinci. (laughs) Leonardo da Vinci said this. He said that patience was like clothes in the cold. That the colder it gets, you just put on more layers. You insulate yourself from the cold. The more layers of clothes you have on, the more cold you can insane. That the deeper our patience is, the more insulated we are from those things that caused us pain and suffering. Not that they don't exist, but that they don't, they don't hurt the same. That we're relying on God more. That we're trusting him more. That as our patience is developed, so is our faith. Because faith is what's driving this. So it affects the relationships that we have with each other. It affects the way we uh, uh, um, deal with situations and circumstances. And this is really oftentimes where our patience gets tested. In Colossians 1.11, he says, we also pray that you'll be strengthened with all his glorious power so that you will have all the endurance and patience you need. May you be filled with joy. So we're not filled with anxiety and worry and tension and frustration and agitation. No, be filled with joy because we're praying that God will give you his patience and endurance that you need. James chapter five says, dear brothers and sisters, be patient as you wait for the Lord's return. Consider the farmers who patiently wait for the rains in the fall and in the spring. They eagerly look for the valuable harvest to ripen. You too must be patient. 
take courage for the coming of the Lord is near. Don't grumble about each other, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. For look, the judge is standing at the door. For examples of patience and suffering, dear brothers and sisters, look at the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. We can patiently endure the suffering. We can look at the examples that he's pointing to in the Old Testament, in the prophets, and see this, that they suffered like we suffered, many of them suffering far greater than we will suffer. But God kept his word, that God kept his promises, and that pain and that suffering ended, and it will for us too. But ultimately, patience is really, it's, it's, it's at the heart of what it means to live by faith. Patience with God requires faith. It's, it's an exercise of our faith to, sen- to surrender total control of our life to him. Which is what we do when we cry out to him and we ask for forgiveness, that, that he would be our savior We surrender control of our life. The issue is is that we take it back. We go, God, it's all, we just sang it. It's all yours. It's all yours until something uncomfortable, difficult, painful happens. And we go, but not this or this or this. I'm going to hold these things. You know why? Because I think ultimately I'm going to handle these better than you. I I don't like the direction you're probably going to take these in. I know where this is going and I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not ready to forgive them. I want to really just tell them how I feel. I want to hurt them like they hurt me. So I'm going to to keep control of this part for now. But this is really an exercise of faith that we truly have surrendered our life to them. We lack faith when we take control back. So our patience with God that he's giving us that we experience and then we share is only as strong as our ability to to surrender to him. But of all the things that we wait for, the things that frustrate us, and if I ever see you in a store, don't ever get behind me in a checkout line. I get the wrong one every time. I catch every red light every time. But God is always worth waiting for. He's always worth waiting for. God keeps his promises in his timing, not ours. And we have to trust, this is faith, that God is going to do what he said he's going to do. And his timing is better than any time that we would choose. And we can have patience with peace because it's his patience and not ours. It's evidence of his work, his Holy Spirit in us. So we have an enemy that wants to rob our soul of this peace and patience and love and joy and self-control and all nine of these virtues that God pours down into us when we have the right relation, when we're abiding with the Father through the Son. He wants to give us these things that only he has. But we have an enemy of our soul that wants to rob us of these things. So what he does is he puts us on a timetable where everything needed to be done 10 minutes ago. And we live a life where we're frantically trying to do a million things, wishing there were more hours in the day to get them done. And we rush and we rush and we rush. And we're always hurried in what we do. Carl Jung was a psychiatrist and he said, hurry is not of the devil. Hurry is the devil. God is patient. He gives his patience. He's never in a hurry. We are. So how much do we miss? And we know the reality of this. We know we do this, and yet we still do it. We rush through getting things done, checking the boxes, and we miss the experience, the joy of doing them, of spending time with people, of enjoying God's time, presence, But what God is doing through this sanctification process of giving us these virtues of his fruit through his work is he's moving us from who we are and who we were to who he desires us to be. 
and by nature we are impatient. But his desire is for us to be patient. Not just to have self-control so we portray patience, but to actually be patient inside. To have a patient heart and a patient mind that we would have this rest in our soul that even under a heavy weight of this life and the painful, frustrating, agitating situations and circumstances that we find ourselves in, we trust him and his time. So this patience lesson is so hard to learn because it is under strain and pressure and it is uncomfortable. But it's how God develops it. It's how he strengthens it. It's how he protects us. And the more that we rely on him, the deeper our faith grows, the more we trust him. So the question we have to answer is, is God worth waiting for? Is he worth waiting for? Well, the answer to that is always yes. And in a setting like this, we would probably all agree the answer is yes. But then the real question is, is will I wait? Will I do it? when I start to feel some pressure and some weights and strain and my patience is being tested and I can proclaim that God is worth waiting for and waiting in, do I do it? That's the evidence of our faith. That's evidence of our trust in him. And maybe we say, yes, God is worth waiting for and I will wait. Then the next question is, how long will you wait? At what point does the tension and the stress become overwhelming? Do we start to take it back and we break under the pressure? How long we will wait is evidence of his patience in us. Whether we wait is evidence of our faith in him. But here's something I've learned and you've learned this. We'll be patient if what we're waiting for is worth it. We were driving home yesterday with the girls in the car. It was not going as planned. And Melissa said, I need to get a coffee. And I said, well, there's a Starbucks right there. And I looked and I'm like, there's no cars in the line. They might be closed. And she said, no, just we'll go. If there's no cars, just go. So I turned the corner and I pulled into the parking lot and I'm like, do you see what they did? They strategically planted those bushes out front so you can't see that line of cars that goes all the way around. <laughs> no joke. I'm like, that's smart. And Melissa said, I'm not waiting for that coffee. I'm not waiting. I'll make a pot when I get home. It wasn't worth it to her to wait. I've waited in line four hours for a roller coaster, but I get agitated waiting in line 30 seconds at Walmart. It's not worth it to me. Is God worth it to you? Is seeing his plan and his timing worth it? The answer is yes. He's worth waiting for. We will wait as long as it takes till God moves. Why would we do that? Because we trust him more than anything or anyone else. Romans 8, 28 is a verse I come back to often in my life. I have to remind myself of this it says, we know that God causes everything to work together for the good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. When we think the direction that God is going is wrong, we have to remember that everything he works is for the good. It may not be what we want, but it will be for our best. It may not be when we want, but it will be for our best. His timing and his plan are greater than ours. So we come back to his truths, that God is good and that God can be trusted. And our prayer should be that we would grow in this patience that only comes from him, that we would grow in faithful patience, that we would live in this blessing, this place of receiving his patience, that he doesn't deal with us as we do with each other or that we do with him that we would grow in this patience and the world would see through that that God is good and God can be trusted. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for Jesus.
I thank you for his sacrifice that makes this possible, that we can have the right relationship with you because of your son, that he died in our place. That's what we deserve. We deserve death for our sins. But you sent him to save us. So we don't experience your judgment and your wrath. We get to experience the blessing of your patience that you give us time. And in that time, we experience forgiveness that you take away the guilt and the shame that the enemy continues to try to pile on us and remind us of who we were when you're trying to show us who we're going to be through you. Lord, when our patience gets tested, and it will, remind us of the truths that you are good and you should be trusted. When we want to take control back, that we remember you are good and you can be trusted. And we are to to wait patiently and that you help us in our weakness and that we can faithfully endure this suffering because we know, God, you are in control. Remind us of these truths, God, and let our lives manifest your peace and that this lost and dying world would know the truth about you and that your lost children would come home. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your patience. We thank you for Jesus. It's in his name that I pray. Amen.